Welcome to Plenary Session. This is an unusual episode. Recently, I was invited to give a talk to a group from the community. This is a group of the lay public. And the talk's premise was, can you walk us through the events of the last two years, COVID-19, in about 45 minutes? And so what follows is most of that dialogue. This is my point of view about the last two years, what we got right, what we got didn't, as succinctly as I could put it for an audience as broad as you could imagine. So I hope you find this of interest. If you like this podcast, you know what to do. Go to your app and rate it. Like, subscribe, comment, leave a message on YouTube, and you can support us at patreon.com. Until next time. Thank you so much. Thank you for that kind introduction. And um, well, I, I, I don't know if it'll live up to all the billing, but uh, I jotted down some notes for what to talk to you all about. Um, so, you know, um, when I was approached to talk today, I was, I was kind of given sort of a broad uh, coverage to really kind of walk you through, I think, the events of the last two years in 45 minutes. So I hope I can, I hope I can try to do that, um, at least some of the broad strokes. But I guess I will say my, my only real disclosure which is I approach all of the questions about COVID-19 from my biases, which is I'm a practicing clinician. I've had patients get sick with COVID-19. I am uh, a researcher, and I do research on the quality of medical evidence. And I'm also a student of medical history, and so I know that throughout history, lots of people came along, very bright people from the top institutions, who are very, very confident that they knew the perfect answer, the perfect solution. But so often, they were mistaken and that what they were endorsing turned out not to work exactly as they wished. And so that's my bias as I approach sort of the events that occurred. So I thought I'd walk you through. There's several big categories I want to hit on. I want to talk about schools, and I think schools is, I have called it the greatest domestic policy failure in the last quarter century. And I think that the schools issue and closing schools, particularly at young ages, will be an intensely destabilizing event, both for health and also political stability. Uh, I'll talk about masks and walk you through some of the data there and some of the changes. I'll talk about vaccines. Um, I'll talk about the situation we're in now after vaccination. What is our goal? What are we trying to do with our policy? Um, and then some things about restrictions broadly, what's going on in Shanghai. But I wanted to start by talking about the early events, December 2019 and beyond. So I'll start there, early events, and then we'll try to hit schools, masks, vaccine, and restrictions. So the early events, I remember you know, the first time I became concerned about COVID-19, and it was a New York Times story where they showed satellite imagery of Wuhan and the Chinese government erected a new hospital in two weeks. And so I thought to myself, they're building a hospital in two weeks, something is going on. You, know, you don't build a new hospital in two weeks unless there are a lot of people suddenly very ill and you're hitting healthcare capacity. So I thought to myself, this is likely to be a very real and significant uh, event, and, uh, and I was concerned. Uh, the next thing I noticed, from December of 2019 until February of 2020, if you turn on CNN and you look at the same people who are commenting today, the exact same people who've written the op-eds for the last two years, they have all made an appearance where they said, don't worry about COVID-19. They said it's less deadly than the flu. In fact, the flu has killed 40,000 people this year and COVID only killed nine people. You know, so COVID, we don't have to worry about COVID. Uh, flu is a greater concern to us. Um, there's a, a sort of thinker, Nassim Nicholas Taleb, who talks about um, fat tail probability distributions, and what's his thinking? You know, he says that um, sometimes people say, you know, more people die in a swimming pool than from terrorism. So you should be more worried about a swimming pool than you should be about terrorism. Put, let's put the risks in perspective. But Taleb's point is that risk is both the average, how many events happen per year, but also the potential that in any moment something very, very bad could happen. And so we know how many people drown in pools per year. It's going to be roughly that number every single year. It's not going to go 100 times or 1,000 times different in the next year because we're not building 1,000 times more pools. But we don't know that about terrorism. The right terrorist act, the nuclear weapon, it could be cataclysmic. And so terrorism, even though the average events are low, doesn't mean you shouldn't worry about the extreme events. And I think that was always true with respiratory viruses, that you can't compare COVID-19 to the flu because you don't know it has the potential to be a global cataclysm. And in fact, it's what happened. It is far more deadly than the flu over the last two years. So I think all of those experts were wrong. But they didn't acknowledge that they were wrong. And I still think they continue to make incorrect proclamations. And they don't take ownership of the fact that they have been consistently wrong. I think it was all pretty quiet in the United States. I think we thought ourselves insulated from this. We had heard about that Diamond Princess cruise ship. Uh, Trump famously said, you know, don't let them off the cruise ship because it's going to 
double our numbers on land, and so we don't, you know, we don't want to double our numbers, even on the cruise ship. Um, and I think many people were sort of, uh, sort of, you know, living in the in the, in the idea that you know it's, it cannot affect us. Uh, but then in March, early March, Imperial College London put out a report, and the report was a modeling exercise. And the model suggested that if unchecked, a million people would die within the first few waves of the pandemic in the United States. And that, I think, woke up policymakers, that a million deaths was unprecedented. We have to do something in response. But some of us were also skeptical of the modeling. Because you may recall that every, every season, there was a hurricane that is approaching the shores. And they generate many, many models of where that hurricane will strike. And sometimes they're right, but sometimes they're wrong. They're wrong about where the hurricane touches land. And sometimes the hurricane actually veers. Because these models, although well-intentioned, although mathematical, they are fundamentally limited. They're limited by what we know, our assumptions, what we put into the model. And I think that's plagued a lot of the discussion of COVID-19 is that we rely on modeling. Um, even, you know, we'll talk about masking. People talk about how, you know, uh, models suggest that if everyone did this, it would work so perfectly. But modeling's not reality. Reality's messy. People don't always do what you think they do. They don't behave the way you want them to. You know, and of course, you have to accept that. That's who we are with people. So anyway, I, I thought the Imperial College London report was probably um, an overestimate. The other thing that happened in, in the early weeks of 2020 was we had witnessed that China actually was able to lock down a city. If you would read pandemic guidance from the Bush administration, George W. Bush was very concerned about uh, the potential for epidemics. He commissioned a number of reports and a number of researchers to look into this. Lockdown was never on the table. It was not thought to be acceptable in a liberal democracy. It was not thought to be something we could even do. Even in a flu pandemic that would ravage young ages, it was thought that we could never lock down the society. People would not comply. They would, they would revolt. They could, you couldn't keep them in their house. And then the other thing, uh, but, but I do think that the events in Wuhan, that, we, that Western policymakers witnessed an authoritarian regime lock down their society, gave us the clue that, well, maybe it's possible, gave us the inspiration. Um, on March 17th, a professor at Stanford, John Unides, famously wrote an essay critical of the lockdown. And I think he's been maligned in a number of ways. And I think if you go back and read his essay, what he was saying was a couple of things. One, I don't know how bad this is going to be. It could be very mild. It could be horrific. I think he outlined both possibilities. And I think, but people criticize him and say, oh, he thought it was going to be mild. I think if you read that essay, it's that he also had some upper bound estimates that were very high. He also said that if we lock down society, he writes, quote, unintended evolutions may occur. Civil instability, war. Um, he alluded to these possibilities. I think by the summer of 2020, we had seen you know wide scale um, protests in the streets over George Floyd. Now, of course, that is a noble cause. I think we all are opposed to racism, but to what degree were those protests also fueled by? I think people feeling some pent up anxiety about being kept in their house for so long and wanting to get out on the street. What about the war in the Ukraine? Is that some degree linked to COVID-19, an opportunity that Putin has seen? I think John may be right that unintended evolutions may yet occur, and school closure may create the greatest unintended evolutions. Lockdown was not precedent. It never happened in human history. There was no data, really, that it was going to be effective. I think that was a hope. Um, and people always say, well, if we didn't lock down, we let people go out to work, you know, it would have been way worse, obviously. But I think that's a misconception, because in science, we call it the counterfactual. And Philip Roth wrote a great book called The Counter Life, which means, like, what would have happened if we didn't do this? If governments didn't tell you to stay home and didn't make laws that suspended businesses, what would have happened? Would we all have gone around like it was nothing? I don't think so. I think humans will voluntarily change our behavior a great deal. We have cell phone tracking data from a number of cities with or without lockdown. Behavioral change is dramatic. When you see cases going up on the news, you stay home, especially if you have access to money, a nice house, those sorts of things. Lockdown was, it's the, it's the delta effect, it's the extra effect beyond your, your natural behavioral change. And I think that that effect might fall predominantly on marginalized communities, on poor populations, on people who actually need to work, bus drivers, and people, and, and people who are working in jobs where you just can't do it on Zoom. And that's the last thing I want to talk about, Zoom. This pandemic response was wedded to the rise of big technology. If we didn't have Uber Eats and Amazon Prime and Netflix, if we didn't have Zoom, it wouldn't have happened. There wouldn't have been lockdowns, I'll tell you why. If you didn't have Zoom, you would have seen all of the employees at major firms or white collar employees, they would be probably facing layoffs. They, would be, they couldn't come to the office and there would be no reason to have them around. And if you tried to lay off that many upper middle class people, there would be severe uh, protests about that. You're not gonna get away with doing that. The response was contingent on the fact that many people didn't lose their jobs, especially in this area where Facebook and Twitter, you know, they went remote and their 100% labor force stayed on. 
And the moment you keep someone working, they have less of an incentive to be critical of the policy. And so I think if you had, if the same pandemic had struck in 1999, and the bandwidth was slow on the internet, we would never have had lockdowns. What we would have done is tried to find a way to live with it. We would have gone to work, you know, we'd go Monday, Wednesday, and you'd go Tuesday, Thursday, we'd spread out, we'd do our best, we'd accept some level of spread, but we couldn't tolerate so many people being laid off. I think it would be unacceptable. Talk about schools. Sweden, I think many of you may remember, in March of 2020 was deemed a pariah state. They were evil, they were bad. We should for not forget that Sweden is a social democracy. They have higher levels of taxation. They've always spent more on young kids. And Sweden continued running that elementary school every single day of the pandemic. They never closed elementary school. Not one day did they close. They never made the kids wear a mask. They do not mask their kids. They follow the World Health Organization guidelines. Under six, it's the WHO says don't do it. Under 12, say do it only selectively. The, the, the Scandinavian countries and UK never did under 12. So Sweden ran their school like any other school. They didn't install HEPA filters. They didn't well, you know, have this expensive mitigation. And by the summer of 2020, they had published the results in the New England Journal of Medicine. They had exceptionally low levels of hospitalizations and deaths in the school. The rates were something like seven in a million ICU visits, and I believe maybe one death in the entire, maybe even zero death, if I recall correctly, paper by Ludwigsen. Um, they also quantified the risk to teachers. I think we were very worried what the risk to teachers were. They showed that compared to the average person in Sweden, a teacher has 1.3 times the risk of getting COVID-19. But that was still lower than other occupations, like being a bus driver, a taxi driver, which is too close to two, being a line cook in a restaurant. Those were much riskier professions. So we're talking about a teacher in school had a slightly higher risk than average, sure, but that risk was not out of the ballpark of what people face, and certainly lower than other occupations that were continued to run. And then the final piece of the puzzle. By the fall of 2020, Germany had published a study, and they had a very interesting natural experiment. And all these rules deployed for COVID-19, those happen any day of the week, but their school closure for the summer holiday was pre-specified. Somebody closes one week early and this school closes the next week, and I think they want to prevent a run on the summer holiday places. And they've had this long standing. So you can actually, using Germany data, disambiguate the role of schools in spreading the virus from the role of the other mitigation efforts. And what they found was no statistically detectable effect of opening or closing schools on viral spread. But this did not appear to be driven by children in contrast with other respiratory viruses like influenza. So I think by the fall of 2020, there was sufficient evidence that closing schools will do nearly nothing to improve the COVID outcomes. And we also knew that they would do a great deal of harm to keep closing these schools for the kids. Because we know that schools are the last tattered rope ladder of upward mobility left in this country. And by closing schools, you're going to be condemning children to uh, a totally different life. I mean, there will be dropouts from the labor market, there'll be increases in teen pregnancy, there'll be increases in gun violence and depression and anxiety, and all of these things have since and continue to bear out. There's still millions of children who are lost. They're, nobody hasn't been in touch with them since the original school closures. They could be the victims of uh, abuse, uh, sexual or physical abuse, and schools were the last place where they could have it detected. So I think school closure, which by the way, so Sweden didn't do it at all, but other countries in Europe did it very briefly. Switzerland, six weeks, and they were up again open. What did we do in this country, especially in this area, especially Berkeley, especially Los Angeles, we're 18 months of school closure. You know, we were the worst. We are the people who were supposed to take the most serious, but what we didn't take seriously were the harms to children from school closure. And the guy in Florida, who is uh, such a bad guy apparently, he was good about it actually. He got people back in in July against the advice of uh, experts like Fauci. So I guess, I guess that's what I wanted to start with, that I think that there was an error initially, that error was not taking it seriously enough, some people say that you know, if we'd only locked down hard for two weeks, the virus would go away, that sort of thing. I think there might have been a window of opportunity for that, but by February it was closed. You're really talking about a December 2019 response. And we see that they're trying to do it in a city of 27 million right now in Shanghai, and I don't think they will succeed. I think they will be obliterated by the virus eventually. So we'll come to that. Let's talk about masks. Um, the prior body of knowledge and the WHO guidance and CDC guidance in March of 2020 was against the advice of community masking. We had done at least 10 plus 10 randomized control trials. They had all shown very equivocal effects in healthcare workers. There were studies that were done in college dormitories. It didn't appear that making people, asking people to mask slowed the spread of other respiratory viruses. And so the consensus was do not recommend people do it. There's a difference I want to clarify. If you wear a fitted N95 perfectly, and by me, I mean fitted. 
it, you got to close the gap at the nose and close the gap at the chin. And if you wear it perfectly, I'm 100% confident it's a highly effective product. You don't smell anything, and there's no virus that can enter that mask, you know. I think that you, you're, it's very protective. But a mask mandate isn't you wearing the right mask perfectly. It's asking people to participate in a social and behavioral experiment where they wear the mask as they see fit. And you know, I was just on the train, you're supposed to wear the mask. Look, everybody got people on their chin, and some people's nose pops out. And what about the quality of the mask that we're recommending? In this country, we have only ever mandated from governments. You know, hospitals have been different, but governments have only mandated the minimum requirement to this day is a cloth mask. When you ride an airplane, what is the most common mask you see? It's a cloth mask. I'll tell you about the data for that, but the data was at the time, in early 2020, we knew that was an ineffective mask. It had never been effective. And to this day, we now know multiple studies show it's an ineffective product. So I, I really puzzle with the fact that we're, we're, everyone wants to die on this hill. And I'm also not an anti, you know, I'm also not somebody who thinks that it's, you know, it's so dreadful. I mean, it's, it's just something you do. I wear pants too, you know, it's no big deal. But, you know, it's no big deal, it bothered me, okay. But, you know, when you recommend people do something and you use the pulpit of public health, you should have some confidence that what you're doing is gonna help make people better off. And we'll come back to that, okay. So Fauci was on 60 Minutes in early March and he famously said, he was asked point blank, should people wear the mask? And he said, no, you know, you touch your face and uh, it's not good. Don't do it, don't do it. You don't have to. If you want to do it, do it, but you don't, you don't have to do it. That was the famous quote. Six weeks later, he went back, and then they required, they, they recommended you wear the mask. And the mask they recommended was a cloth mask. They did so because they didn't want you to take up the healthcare worker supply, so they say. And they said, in retrospect, I, I'm sorry, but you know, the last time I told you not to do it, I was just lying to you. You know? He called it, it was a noble lie. I lied to you because I didn't want you to go out there and grab the, the healthcare worker's mask. I don't want you to take those up. They really need it. You know, you don't need it that bad. But that doesn't make sense for a few reasons. One, now you're telling me, and they literally told you, cut the, cut the heel off your sock and cut some holes in it and put that on your face. But if that's what you're going to recommend to me in April, you could have recommended that to me in March. You know, you didn't need to wait six weeks to tell me to cut the heel off my sock. I cut the heel off my sock six weeks ago. That wouldn't have taken the mask from the healthcare worker. And if you believe you were protecting the supply, you, now there might be a run on masks then. I think the story didn't add up. And I actually think there was a lie. The lie was the opposite. The first time he was on 60 Minutes, he told what he believed to be the truth. And the second time he was on TV and he told you to do it, that was when he was lying. And he was lying because the lie was, you need to give him something. You need to give him something so people feel better about this. And there was a huge effort by people who are experts in mechanistic science that, it pro that they thought it ought to have helped. And they put a lot of pressure and a lot of lobbying to get this done. And so they did sort of push for it and they, and they did achieve the goal that by the, you know, the spring, um, it was uh, something that was being endorsed by a number of health agencies. But the real thing that tipped it over was when Trump famously didn't want to wear one. And the moment he didn't want to wear one, we who don't like him wanted to wear it twice as hard. <laughs> he didn't want to wear one. So we wanted our two-year-olds to wear one. That was another departure. The World Health Organization always, has, this whole pandemic has said, do not mask a child under six. They have explicitly advised against it. Our American Academy of Pediatrics and the CDC, the only nation that has advised to do it from two to six. I think, you know, it's hard. I mean, I have a friend from Switzerland and he told me, he said, you don't even need to know any science to know that doesn't make any sense at all. Just look at the child, wear it. It's not going to go well, you know? And then the other thing about it is, uh, well, I, I will come to that. The Danish study. By the summer of 2020, there was a randomized control trial from, the, from, from Denmark, and it showed that, um, that people who uh, were, assigned, were given a box of masks and told to wear masks uh, versus those who were not, uh, there was no statistically significant reduction in uh, transmission. The Bangladesh randomized control trial took a little bit longer. They randomized six, uh, 600,000 people hundreds of thousands of villages, they found cloth masks that didn't work. They found surgical masks that didn't work um, to, to slow the spread of the virus. But that was not what we advised our population. And even after that data resulted, we didn't update those recommendations. Um, the napping, I wrote down here. You know, I think even the most ardent proponent that very young children, like two to four, should wear this and wear this in daycare, they were omitting one fact, which is that, you know, the kids go into the room and they're in the same room and then they close the door, and then they all take a nap for two hours. And in the two hours, they take off the mask. 
So, I mean, what, what am I to believe? If you believe it works, won't the two hours where you don't wear it and you all breathe the same air sort of just, you know, undo whatever good you're doing for the, you know, the six hours we're wearing it? I mean, it's highly implausible. I feel like we, you know, I tell that to people who are, I mean, I know very smart people who think that, you know, they're confident it works in, in children that young. I think it's highly implausible, especially when they take it off for two hours uh, and stand in the same stagnant air because it is an aerosolized virus and it will spread at that time. It, the virus doesn't nap too. Um, <laughs> N95s, now they have N95s for children and I see the Berkeley School District was recommending it. There's no such thing as an N95 for children because to be an N95, you have to put somebody in a chamber with particles and document under very strict conditions that it can filter 99% of particles below a certain micron size. And that study has never been done with children because children are not compliant enough to participate in these studies. There's no such thing. So everything that says it's an N95 for kids is a counterfeit. I mean, it's just not, they just cannot be confident of that claim. Airplanes. You know, they just extended the airplane mask mandate, and I think, um, you know, I think uh, it's something to be noted that, um, that whether we like it or not, masking has become incredibly political. I mean, the right and Republican states, they don't like to do it, and the left, and democratic states, we do like to do it. And since they don't like to do it, we like to do it extra hard. Um, the airplane one, I baffled with because I guess I think that, you know, um, um, I read this thing, it's not like aspirin. What do I mean by that? You know, a behavioral intervention is not like taking a pill. If I tell you to take aspirin or a blood pressure pill, you take that blood pressure pill today, it's gonna lower your blood pressure so much. Two years later, I give you the same blood pressure pill, you know, it's gonna lower your blood pressure. But a mask mandate is not the same thing because two years or three years into it, you're not going to have the same gusto when you put it on. You're going to slack off. You're going to get tired of it and fatigue. And when you go on an airplane, now I was just on an airplane, I would say there's a 30% of people wearing it correctly. I mean, everyone's eating food. And by the way, if it was so serious, why are you allowed to eat your pretzels for 45 minutes? You know, I mean, come on. I mean, we have to do this, but we get 45 minutes to eat those pretzels. And in first class, they're serving meal all the whole time. They don't wear it in first class. I mean, it's, it appears to me to be classist, irrational, and the recommendation is the cloth mask, which has failed in two randomized trials to date. And when I say this randomized, what is this randomized trial? You know, everything in this world, you want to know whether or not the intervention actually works. And, and people always think, well, we just go out there and look. Let's look at the people who wore masks and the people who didn't. Let's see who got more virus, right? That's how we solve this answer. But we know they're not the same type of person. The person who's wearing the mask is a wealthy person who has their house, who's very worried about COVID, and they're getting everything delivered to their door. And the person who doesn't wear their mask is somebody who's going to the bars and the nightclubs, and they don't care about COVID. So it doesn't just isolate the effect of the mask. It's also the type of person who's likely to comply. And the same thing is true for like these booster studies. I just saw a study yesterday. People who got the fourth dose in the first month they have lower COVID than people who only got three doses. I said, okay, well, what kind of person rushes out to get the fourth dose? It's a very special person. It's a person who takes it very seriously because they're, they got three doses in their arm. They heard about that fourth dose and they're booking the appointment at CVS. There's somebody who's very concerned. And the person who got two doses or three doses, they're a little bit less concerned. So is it the fourth dose that's protecting them or the fact that they're the ones who are more likely to stay home, less likely to go to clubs and all these things? Okay, so this is the problem with real world data is that people do things for all sorts of reasons. You know, people who, you know, people who go to the Equinox gym live longer than people who don't. Yeah, because it's a fancy gym. People who are members of country clubs live longer, of course, because these are things that go along with other patterns of behavior. But randomized trials do something different. They take a lot of people and they randomly assign them to the intervention or not. So you wash away all that. There's going to be some wealthy people who are told to do it and people who are told not to do it. And the only thing that's the variable is the doing it or not doing it. And so when you study these things in randomized fashion, the effects plunge. Five more minutes or ten. Um, <clears throat> ten till the drawing. Ten, ten, ten till the drawing. Okay. <laughs> Vaccines. Um, I mean, I was somebody who was uh, one of the people who thought that it would be very unlikely for them to develop a vaccine so quickly. Um, they did very successfully. And I remember the original randomized control trial, which resulted in what, November 8th, was the Pfizer press release two days after the election showing that Pfizer had a success. And when I saw the results, it was unmistakable. I mean, the reason I was so persuaded that it, the vaccine didn't work was that you saw reductions in one, they got less COVID, two, they were less likely to be hospitalized with COVID, and three, they were less likely to die of COVID. All in the original studies of Pfizer, Moderna. And it didn't work for 10 days and then it started to work, which makes sense because it takes 10 days for the body to start making antibodies to it, okay. 
Um, one of the things that happened was the original Pfizer trial was scheduled and Trump said, you will get this vaccine before the election. And he wasn't making things up. You would have gotten that vaccine before the election if Pfizer had stuck to the original statistical plan. But after intense lobbying, they changed the statistical plan to, look for, to wait for more events. And supposedly, in stat news, they say Borla himself said, stop testing samples until after the election. I think there was an effort to delay the vaccine till after the election because nobody wanted to hand Trump the October surprise and let him win re-election. And I do think that many of the people who pushed for that did result in an unnecessary loss of life, that the, December, that the December and January surge was tremendous. And had you deployed the vaccine two weeks earlier, you would have saved at least 10,000 lives, perhaps, something like that. And so I think that was a political choice that people have whitewashed, but they can't get out. I mean, it will eventually come up in the newspapers because there's such a long paper trail of that that it can be unmistakable. Um, one versus two dose. The UK gave everybody one dose, and then because they had a limited supply, and then they gave the second dose later. We wanted to do that, but Fauci said, don't do that. Do the two doses 21 days apart. I think that is proven to be an error. Um, by, giving, by delaying this, the first dose to more people, you actually had higher um, number of people who were totally unvaccinated. Even one dose provides some benefit. And actually delaying the second dose turns out to be a much smarter strategy. Johnson & Johnson. Johnson & Johnson had a blood, actually maybe I'll skip the Johnson & Johnson. I'll come to the, the boosting question. Um, you know, Pfizer's poised to make $100 billion this year. Their pre-pandemic earnings were $40 billion. They're earning $60 billion off the back of COVID-19. I'm happy to give them a lot of money for their success. They did develop an effective vaccine and it's saved a lot of people. But they need to earn it if they want to keep giving me a shot every four months or six months for the rest of my life. They need to earn it. And by earn it, I mean you need to prove to me that as a 39-year-old person, if I keep getting four and five and six and however many doses you give me, that I'm better off than if I just got two. And the way to prove that, again, is for Pfizer to run a study of people from old to young and show at what ages and with what underlying medical problems, how many do you benefit from. And maybe it's possible that if you're 85 years old and you have medical problems, you really need four, maybe a yearly shot, maybe five, and it reduces your risk of hospitalization. I think it's highly unlikely that if you're 12 or 16 or 20 or 22 and you're healthy, that you benefit from the third or fourth dose. And they've never proven it. And we are allowing them to sell and market their product without proving it, which is handing Borla billions of dollars. I mean, the man took home 20 million plus in personal uh, earnings last year. His company's $100 billion. We have to decide whether or not we want drug regulation to work for people or work for very wealthy companies. And so this is why you know my position on vaccines is I do think that it's good. But like everything in life, you know, um, uh, you have diminishing returns the more you do something. And maybe there's some point where it's diminishing for most of us. And um, the final thing, well, seven minutes. Seven minutes. I guess I want to talk about some of the absurdities. Um, Kyrie Irving. I see this basketball player. Supposedly he's had COVID, I don't know, but he's in his 20s and he's healthy. Um, I guess the one thing I didn't state, I should say it very upfront, is that we knew in like the first weeks of the pandemic that there was an age, that there's, there's an age gradient. Let me put it this way. Um, there are many things that put you at risk of bad outcomes when you get COVID-19. One, you can't change, which is how old you are. The problem with the age is that age is the single greatest risk factor for this virus. The risk to an 85 year old, it's not just a little more than an eight year old, it's 8,500 times more than an eight year old. So the risk of being older is going up on a log scale. It's going up so catastrophically. But there's nothing we can do about our age. But there is things we, but, but weight is something that is a risk factor, and there is something we can do about our weight. And being unvaccinated is a risk factor if you have not yet had COVID, and there's something you can do about that. So those are the modifiable risk factors. We knew very early on that the risk to children for this virus was actually lower than seasonal flu. That was with the original strain. With Omicron, it's even lower than seasonal flu. We know from Germany that zero healthy children between the ages of five and 11 died. We know that when children and adolescents do get very sick with this virus, they're almost always overweight or have underlying medical problems. So there was a way, of course, to let healthy kids get on with life as much as possible while shielding vulnerable kids. And there is a way to vaccinate vulnerable kids preferentially over healthy kids. But we consistently look for a one-size-fits-all policy. And we want to vaccinate every healthy five-year-old. And I guess I don't, I don't mind, I mean, that's fine. 
but uh, I know parents that are like not letting a five-year-old play on play dates until they get you know three doses or etc. You know, if you had let if you would have let a five-year-old play on play dates in 2012 in the winter time, that child was at greater risk of seasonal influenza than the child is today of COVID-19. So we're holding these kids to like an impossible safety standard that we've never held. If you put a kid in a car and drive 700 miles, that's the risk of a child of getting COVID-19. They could be in a car accident 700 miles. So, but we don't think twice about driving from here to Los Angeles or San Diego, but we do think a lot about COVID-19. We have a sort of irrational fear of the young. And older people, I think, sometimes have an irrational, um, they're irrationally cavalier. <laughs> they're not so old, you know? They're, they're irrationally cavalier, and I'd say I'd be a little bit more nervous. You know, if I was 85 and booking a cruise ship, you know, this winter, I'd be a little nervous, you know? That's not where I want to be on that cruise ship. Okay, so Kyrie Irving, what I want to say about Kyrie Irving, he's 20, so his risk is very low. He's an elite athlete, his risk is very low. Supposedly he's had COVID and recovered. Once you've recovered from COVID-19, you may get reinfected, but your probability of getting hospitalized from reinfection is as close to zero as it comes. So if somebody's had COVID and recovered, you know, how much, I'm not gonna, that's not the person I'm gonna go out of my way to try to persuade to get a dose. They're pretty well protected, and that's Kyrie. And apparently, <laughs> this is apparently, since he's an employee of Brooklyn Nets, he's not allowed to play basketball in New York City can't work because they have a workplace vaccine requirement. He didn't do it, so he's not allowed to work. But New York City dropped the vaccine requirement to attend the basketball game. So Kyrie can go sit in the front row, breathe all over the court without a mask on, but he can't step on the court and play. And when he went to the locker room, they fined the team $50,000. This is, you know, I always hear people talk about why, you know, you know, the average Americans, you know, they believe in misinformation, all these things, you know, all these problems, people believe all these sorts of conspiracy theories. And they say, you know, whose fault is that? They say, you know whose fault is? It's Joe Rogan's fault. He's had all these bad guests on. I say, you know, you don't have to look to Joe Rogan. Your policy is so stupid. This guy can stand here, but he can't stand here. You have to blame yourself. If you have a stupid policy, the public will think that you are not competent and they will not look to you with trustworthy eyes. Um, in New York City, the mayor right now has a mask mandate, but it is only for two to four-year-olds. Only for two to four. If you're five and unvaccinated, you don't. But if you're two to four, you got to. I mean, what are we to think with such a policy? I mean, they just don't look competent. And then the same mayor goes to a dinner with 700 people, which is a super spreader event, and he gets COVID at the Gridiron Dinner this week, Mayor Eric Adams. So this guy is going to parties while he's mandating masks in two-year-olds. I mean, it looks terrible. And we've seen all these photos of politicians where they're on masks, but the kids are all masks. I mean, what are they thinking? It doesn't vote well. Um, and then Shanghai. And then the last thing I'd say is, I'll conclude with this, you know what's going on in Shanghai is what people, some people said, we, what they wanted us to do, you know, if we had only locked down harder. But the truth is, and the real truth, that maybe someday people will be more willing to admit. By the time we took COVID seriously in March of 2020, it was too late, it was inevitable. The virus was gonna spread to every single person on earth. The development of the vaccine was a miracle because it dramatically lowers the risk of bad outcomes. But the vaccine has proven now that every single person on earth will get a breakthrough infection. After you're vaccinated, one dose, two dose, three doses, or four, or as many as Borla wants, you will still, if you live long enough, get COVID-19. In the course of, I hope to live 40 more years, you know, I'm probably going to get it four or five times in my life. Um, each time is probably going to be less severe than the time before. It's an endemic virus. There's nothing anyone can do to stop it. Uh, China is trying to stop it. And right now in Shanghai, they've got 27 million people under lockdown. They've got them trapped in their apartments. They can't even go out to pick up the package. They have to have a certain time window to go pick up the package, even if the package is like fresh meat. People are going hungry. If a family gets COVID-19, if the child under seven gets it, they take the child away from the family and put them in a central detainment center. If the family gets COVID-19 and their pets in the house, they drag the pets out of the street and exterminate the pets. This is what it takes to, I mean, in fact, it takes more. If they really wanted to do it, it takes more. No free society could ever have done this. We could never have locked down harder. You think in this country you can take someone's dog out, shoot the dog in the street? And they're not going to allow you to do that. They're not going to allow you to do that. It, yeah, it will be war. I mean, I, I do think it will be it will be a civil war. You try to do that someplace in this country like Texas. It's not going to happen. So we could never have done these kinds of draconian things. And also, I think it's it's hubris to think that we can stop like mother. We can stop mother nature. You know, what, why, do, why does the virus exist? Why do all the viruses exist? Because part of what it means to be human is we have to breathe the same air and be close to each other. We can't not do that. The more we don't do that, our mental health will deteriorate, as it is deteriorating, and it's not who we are fundamentally. The virus has had thousands and millions of years to evolve to who we are. 
There will always be a respiratory virus. It will always spread. There's, it will never be able to be stopped. Um, and you know, people are grateful that we haven't had colds and flus like that for a few years. But what will happen is there'll be a rebound epidemic. So I think this fall and the next fall and the fall after, you'll get sick more than you've ever gotten before. Mm. Uh, because you can't keep these things at bay. And so I think once you're vaccinated, I've always been a proponent that we gotta get back on, get on with life. Because you're vaccinated, you can get the booster if you wanna get the booster. But you know, you can't keep putting your own life on hold. Um, and if not, you know, you'll have it on hold indefinitely because it's not gonna be better in five years. There'll still be the same virus circulating. Um, okay. Those are my thoughts on the history of COVID-19. <laughs> <laughs> on that positive note. Um, happy to, happy to take any questions. That's a great question. So, what would I have done? Okay. <clears throat> You're on the 30 minutes though. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think that one, one missed opportunity and the thing that you really need to fault the prior president for was uh, supposedly by a number of accounts that he was told repeatedly in January and February about the virus and he said, you know, shrug your shoulders. I think there was an opportunity to put intense pressure on China to tell the truth about what was going on, how far it had spread, and there was an opportunity to deploy teams and try to stop it, you know, nip it before it had spread globally. But by March 2020, if you put me in charge in March, let's say March 15, 2020, the horse was out of the barn. I mean, you had widespread global transmission and the chains would never be broken. People say Australia, New Zealand did great. Sure, they got two advantages. One, it's smart to make yourself an island nation and drop yourself into the ocean. That's a clever thing to do. <laughs> the next thing they had was the seed load. I mean, we forget that seed load means how many people from that country come to your country on a daily basis. Wuhan to US trans uh, visitation and, you and Wuhan to Europe was so high that by the time you got to March 2020, there were so many different people who had it, there's nothing you could do that would prevent some of those clusters from growing. But Australia and New Zealand, they probably have very low seed loads, so they could lock down and really suppress it. I think we missed that. I think what we should have done differently was, and I hate to say this, I mean, not to hate to say this, because these people got a lot of grief. The people who signed this thing, Jay Bhattacharya from Stanford, and this, these scientists who people were very critical of, where they said we need focus protection of older people and we need to sort of encourage young people to get back to life. I think um, eventually history will vindicate them as having been correct, that we actually screwed up horrifically with older people. You remember Cuomo took people who were sick with COVID and put them in nursing homes. By force of law, they had to go back in the nursing home with COVID, which is like sending a cruise missile into a nursing home because it decimated the nursing homes. But that's the exact opposite of what you wanted to do. You should have put nursing homes on very strict precautions People who worked in nursing homes should have been assigned like one week shifts. You come to work for your week, we test you, you live there on site, we'll build uh, like a building next to it to house you, and at the end of your week you go back to your life, we'll pay you handsomely for that because the nursing home people are so vulnerable. You know, and to, in the early few waves, 40% of deaths were in nursing homes. So I put all my energy there. On the other side, the schools. The more you close schools, the more you create panic. I mean, you really created panic because people worry about their kids more than they worry about themselves. But the risk to children were always lower than seasonal influenza. And in the United Kingdom, they actually reopened schools in six weeks, and before they got the vaccine, they have 95% of those kids have antibody positivity, meaning that they got it, they don't even know they got it. So those kids already got it, and then many of them are already in the United Kingdom. We closed, we have lower antibody positivity, but pre-vaccine, we're still 50%. 50% of these kids have gotten COVID and recovered, many of whom, the, perhaps the majority, you don't even know, because kids get it it's so mild, it's like they didn't have anything at all. I think closing schools was a catastrophic error, and uh, it was an error that some people saw through, and, you know, for better or worse, and, and to be perfectly honest with you, I'm a far left progressive, I'm a Bernie Sanders supporter, you know, before the pandemic, but I think it was the Republican governors that were right. DeSantis was right, he reopened schools in April, May, and uh, Texas was right, and then we in California, we were totally wrong, and uh, and we're gonna we're gonna pay the price. I think we're we're gonna we're gonna really pay the price for that for that error. I think there's a lot of things that I think that people think sound great, but were errors um, that I would have done. Uh, and I'm not a, I'm not in the mandate and and uh, passport business. Uh, like right now, at this point, I think the passport. Like if you go to a restaurant, and you show them your vaccine card. Um, that's doing a great job of separating people who can spread the virus from people who can spread the virus because everyone can spread the virus now. So there's no point in checking the card. We can do away with the card. I think when Biden decided to fire healthcare workers and put pressure through that, I think that was a bad decision because like, there was already a certain trajectory of people being vaccinated. It was growing by the day. 
And if you implement a mandate, you might change the trajectory. I estimate maybe two to three percentage point change. You'll change it in people 18 to 64, more than 65 to 90. Because 65 to 90, they're not in the workforce. You can really only start getting working age people. But that's not where your focus should be. And in exchange for increasing it maybe two percentage points, you'll displace maybe one in 1,000, one in 10,000 people will be fired from their job. Those people will be very upset and, you know, and, 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 uh, and a political liability. And they will come back and they'll never be happy with you for, I think, the rest of their lives. Um, and I think we still haven't seen the full brunt of what those harms will be. And in America, people don't like to be told what to do. And, uh, and you know, I just don't think they do. And I think you should use that power very sparingly. You should use mandates very sparingly. Right now, we have a number of legislation in California that's pending to you know, mandate this vaccine for kids to go to school. I think it would be, if they do it, it would be catastrophic because it's going to knock out probably tens of thousands, 100,000 kids from school. Because you know, even if you get more kids to do it, there's always some kids not going to do it. And then you can kick those kids out of school, and they're going to lose far more in their like, livelihood and upward mobility than you'll ever gain. And so I guess, you know, I don't have all the answers, but the two things I would have done was I would always get a table full of people where half the people disagree with the other half. You know, I think you always have to have a table of rivals when you make these kinds of choices. And I think I don't see that with, the, you know, with, any, with either administration. They all got people who agree, and the people who don't agree, they get pushed out. You need to have people who disagree because nobody knows the answer for these things. And then the next thing I do is I think you should always tread lightly. Um, and realize that human beings have always thought we can improve upon our condition, and very often we shoot ourselves in the foot. And so I, I'm a, I believe a light touch on some of these things.